Good morning. How is everybody? Yeah, that, that good. Huh? Everyone's all like, uh huh. I've, uh, I've been like, my both of our, our car leases are up in like a week and a half. And it's like the absolute worst time to have to buy a car. I don't know if any of you, I didn't know how bad it was. Like we've, we've leased cars for like 15 years and I always handle it. And we go out to, um, we always go out to the Valley and they have like hundreds and hundreds of like cars to choose from. And I contacted them. We're like, we have two cars. Like, do you like it or not? And they're like, you know, it's just crazy. I was like, I don't want any color, but like white. And they're like, well, we have white. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, but at least they have like cars. So I've been like going back and forth with this guy for like three weeks, it feels like, but it's only been two days. It's like constant back and forth, trying to fight like other people for the one, one car that they have on the lot, right? It's crazy how, uh, how much like COVID has affected everything. Like you wouldn't think that, I thought the car market would be better by now. Anyway, that's my, that's my life right now. I'm like moving back and forth over like the one car they have on their lot or two. Um, I was just looking at our syllabus. This is crazy, right? Today's the 25th. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six days left, including today. So again, I know everyone's tired and kind of at the end, but we're, we're, we're right there. So hang in there. Yeah. Six classes, including today. So if you don't count today, it's five. If you don't count the final, it's four. <laughs> we can just keep going. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very little that we have left. It's kind of wild. Our last day of regular class is the May 9th, and then the 11th is the day we have our final, but that'll be virtual. So we're definitely getting down to it. We have disorders, therapies, and social psych left. So that's, uh, that's it. But this is definitely, I think this unit is one that uh, most people tend to think of when they think of psychology. And if you're really interested in this topic, um, there is a class we have here called Abnormal Psychology. It's Psych 8. Um, I teach it every semester. There are obviously other people who teach it as well. Uh, but if you like this topic and want to know more about it, uh, you could always take that class. It's a great next one after this if you're still interested in psychology. But we'll just kind of go over some of uh, a couple of ideas to set the stage, and then we'll go over some of the bigger disorders that are out there. Um, and then the next unit, we'll talk about how do we treat them. So that's kind of our plan for the next uh, week or two. And then we end with uh, social psychology, which is as broad as psychology gets a lot of overlap with uh, sociology. So um, yeah, we'll get into this today. It'll take us a couple of uh, class sessions. And as I said, what we'll do is we'll um, <clears throat> set the stage just a little bit. We'll talk about just a couple of like side things um, that you would obviously learn a lot more about if you took like an abnormal psych class. But just a few things about how do we define what's normal versus abnormal? How do we uh, diagnose people? What are some of the drawbacks to that? And then we'll get into the different disorders from, from there. <clears throat> so in this chapter, we're looking at psychological disorders. And I imagine a lot of you, if not all of you, know somebody who you either know has a disorder, or maybe you suspect <laughs> has a disorder, or maybe you struggle with one of these um, yourself. Psychological disorders are very, very common. It's also an incredibly common uh, psychology student phenomenon to think that you have every disorder that we talk about. So just to put that out there in the world as, as we're going through these, if you're like, oh my God, I have that one and that one and that one and that one and that one, I have 14 disorders. There's no way, maybe you have one, maybe two at the most, but there's no way you could have all of them. So just kind of keep that in your back of your mind as we talk about them. And if it sounds like you or someone you know, you could always go find uh, a little bit more information and look at it more. We'll just do a little bit of an overview. But disorders sometimes uh, can be difficult to identify. How do we draw the line between maybe somebody who's like a little odd and eccentric versus having a disorder? Somebody who's sad because something bad happened in their life versus someone who has clinical depression. And it's not always easy to know, right? It's not black and white like we tend to think um, that it's obvious. It doesn't tend to be that way. There's this uh, guideline that psychologists sometimes use called the five D's of abnormality. Technically, it's the four D's, but I added a fifth one uh, because I think it, uh, it makes sense. And there was another D that I could add in there. But uh, deviance, distress, danger, dysfunction, and duration. Now, these aren't necessarily symptoms, but if somebody has behaviors that are deviant, distressful, dangerous, dysfunctional, and last for a certain amount of time, then we start to wonder if maybe they might have something bigger going on. So if something is deviant, it differs from what everyone else is doing, right? Like none of you today are dressed abnormally. 
right? Like if you showed up today to school in like full Halloween costume, that would be deviant, that'd be different. All of you are sitting in your desks facing forward, right? If you were standing in the back corner of the classroom, that would be deviant and different. We'd all look at you and wonder what was going on. So when behavior or thoughts or anything is different from what is kind of typical or normal, which is incredibly subjective, of course, we might wonder about the presence of a disorder. When people have behaviors that cause them stress, right? Oftentimes disorders cause people stress. They make their life difficult. Or you have so much anxiety that it's difficult to go to class because you're so worried you might get called on, right? Or that maybe you'd have to talk in front of the class somehow. Uh, you have so much anxiety that you struggle to um, take an exam and it's affecting your grade in some capacity. It causes you danger. Not all disorders, but a lot of disorders have an element of danger to them, right? Maybe you're hurting yourself or hurting others or you're putting yourself in harm's way. Um, dysfunction, it affects your ability to like maintain your life. Maybe you're so, uh, again, uh, struggling with disorders so much that you have a hard time maintaining friendships and relationships. You have so much uh, depression that you can't seem to go out and do things with your friends, so it's costing you friendships. And then it lasts. It lasts longer than you would expect, right? When something bad happens to you, it's normal to react. We talked about that a little bit with like PTSD, but this is something that lasts longer than like what is typical. And again, the tricky thing is a lot of these terms are really subjective. Like what's dangerous or deviant to me might not be so to you. What is dangerous or deviant or dysfunctional right now in 2000, I must say 2012 or 2022, that's, that's not normal, right? I'm long night, right? Uh, 2022 might not be normal 10 years from now or 10 years ago, okay? And different cultures as well. So this is a very subjective thing, but when people have these five Ds, we start to wonder and maybe look a little bit more at like specific disorders from there. One other really, really big thing, <clears throat> again, still kind of setting the stage, is that there's a lot of different perspectives or models that we can look at mental illness through. And these are the big ones that are up here, but there are even more than this, of course, but um, there are, are quite a few. The medical model, the psychoanalytic model, cognitive behavioral, diathesis stress, and then the biopsychosocial. And what these models do is they're a way of viewing a phenomenon, right? So if we think that a disorder is caused by something biological, we're going to treat it biologically. If we think a disorder is caused by negative thinking patterns, we're gonna try and change the way that you think. So these are ways to kind of view or frame a disorder. And they oftentimes drive treatment and uh, kind of explanations for what caused it. So sometimes they overlap. Some models are better for certain disorders. But let's look at each one. I'm going to write some um, like keywords up on the board just to try and help you keep them um, straight. So the medical or biological model. If we think in medical or biological stuff, we're seeing that disorders have a physiological basis to them, that they have physical culprits, if you will, right? And so some of the very common ones, it might be genetic. So it could be genes. Genetics would be something biological. Maybe you inherited a tendency to have depression because one of your parents had depression, right? It could also be neurotransmitters. Dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, right? So many of these different neurotransmitters, a lot of those play a big role in mental illness, right? Dopamine and serotonin and a few others play a huge role in depression. GABA plays a huge role in anxiety. Right, so maybe somebody has a neurotransmitter imbalance and that's what's causing them to have depression. We could also add anatomy or even hormones. The essence of these is that they're all biological stuff, right, that's causing you to have a mental illness. And if we think you have depression because of a neurotransmitter imbalance, we're going to give you a drug to fix those neurotransmitters. So not only do they explain it, but they also drive treatment. From a psychoanalytic model, this is Freud. Freud believed that disorders come from like unconscious internal conflicts. So we, for this one, we could put like uh, the unconscious mind. Freud was also all about early childhood. Interactions with your parents. 
and sexual and aggressive urges. So Freud said a lot of our pathology stems from when we're little, right? The interactions that we have with our parents when we're very, very young, things that we aren't aware of at any given moment. Freud thought the unconscious mind was so incredibly powerful, right? And he called the unconscious mind like that driving force for us. And it comes out in things like dreams and Freudian slips. If you've ever said the wrong person's name or the wrong thing, right, that's a Freudian slip. I had a biology professor who used to always say orgasm instead of organism, right? And we're like, we know what you're thinking about, right? Um, like he would always say that. He'd be like, this orgasm, sorry, organism. And he was so sleazy about it every time. But those little slips reveal the unconscious mind. It comes out in dreams. But early childhood stuff, stuff that happens when you're very, very young, Freud believed that would be the driving force behind developing a disorder. But cognitive behavioral, this is a really big one. And it's combining two different perspectives, right? Your thoughts and your behaviors, right? And you can look at these separately, but they're often combined together. So we can look at the thoughts that you have, the thoughts or expectations. We also look at behaviors and conditioning. Sometimes people fake being sick because they get attention and sympathy for it, right? We've all done that at some point, maybe fake being sick to get out of work or school. Sometimes for people that can become like a chronic thing that they do, really easy to do now, right? Like it's super easy to be sick now, right? You're like, oh, I have a runny nose, must be COVID, can't go, right? There's like almost no question to it, it's too easy. But very common that maybe somebody's rewarded for a behavior, so that reinforces it and they do it more. Maybe somebody has anxiety because of the irrational thoughts that they have, right? And so we can combine those together. This is a really very common one. The thoughts and behaviors that we have can also drive and influence mental illness. Yeah. Do you think that psychological disorders are more prevalent in first world countries than they are in third world countries due to like how our social constructs work? Yeah, I could see that for sure, right? That we... Uh, I don't want to say that it's a matter of like privilege to identify these, but like in a way, I think that our culture definitely has a much more higher prevalence of these disorders because of, you know, the healthcare system that we have is so like well developed um, because of our ability to focus on things beyond like maybe just being hungry or not having access to basic resources. Uh, it makes sense, right, that maybe we would have more for that reason. Every culture views mental illness a little differently. It's interesting that, for example, I just read this article um, about Ireland and schizophrenia. In, schiz in Ireland, they don't view schizophrenia as a severe mental illness the way that we do. Um, and so every culture has like a slightly different take and perspective. But I think your point makes a lot of sense that you think about uh, how you know, we have access to so much more. So it makes it easier to look at these things than maybe if we didn't have that access. Uh, diathesis stress. Two more. The diathesis stress one is really um, common with schizophrenia and some of the more severe disorders. The idea here is that you have a genetic predisposition and then there's an environmental trigger. So maybe you're born with a vulnerability to develop schizophrenia, which you might not know, right? There's no way of knowing that necessarily. And then you have the right environmental trigger, like maybe it's drug use or something traumatic. It would trigger that predisposition and have you develop the disorder. Now, if you never had the environmental trigger, you might not ever develop it, right? Um, and so I had, a, I had a colleague whose husband went off to war and because of the trauma of combat, it triggered his genetic predisposition to develop schizophrenia and those symptoms started to come forward. Yeah, and so if you never had that kind of trauma or that event, maybe you never developed the disorder. Very, very common perspective that something in the environment triggers a predisposition that's lying within you. And you, again, might not ever know that you are predisposed to it unless maybe it runs in your family and it's something that you're pretty aware of. The last one is kind of a combo of everything. So the systems approach is the biopsychosocial approach. 
which basically is saying that it's a culmination of everything. And if you ever want to sound brilliant in psychology, this is really all you have to say, right? It was a combination of all of the factors that led to X. You're probably right, right? Because that's almost always the case, right? It's probably some combination of all of these things that cause somebody to develop a mental illness, right? But from each of these perspectives, we're going to focus on slightly different things, and that's going to drive the way we view the disorder and then also treat it. So uh, these models play a really big role. We won't get too into like causes and treatments in here specifically to each disorder. But if you did take an abnormal psych class, for every disorder, you would look at what are some of the, the causes, which model fits best, and then how does that drive treatment? Uh, but for now, this would be a great like matching question for you on our final, on our last exam. Like maybe I give you some of these uh, terms and I have you match it to the right perspective. So uh, make sure that you, uh, that you get these down so that you are able to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments or thoughts about this? I felt like I needed to smile and get in there, but I'll move out instead. <laughs> right. Any questions, thoughts, anything? How many of you have heard of the DSM before? Several of you, a couple of you. Okay, DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. We're currently in the fifth edition, the DSM-5. This has been around for a long time. They update it every handful of years uh, to reflect things going on in our society and in our culture. But the DSM is the book that we use to diagnose people. All of the disorders that are recognized are in the DSM. It's like a long list. And each disorder has different symptoms that you have to have in order to be diagnosed with it. And so what we see is this has about like 400 disorders or so in it. We're only going to cover some of the more common ones, but there are tons of these. If you go back to like the 1950s, there were only about 60. So every time that we revise this, we add new ones, we change the names sometimes to reflect research. But the DSM is the book that we use to diagnose and um, label people with a mental illness. And the whole idea of diagnosing people and labeling people is really mixed. If any of you have ever had a label, right, they can be somewhat damaging or difficult, right? Uh, if somebody has ever labeled you as like lazy or difficult, or maybe you have depression or you have whatever, right? Sometimes they become like self-fulfilling prophecies or they change the way we view ourselves or change the way we view other people. So diagnoses and labels are mixed, but they can also be really helpful as well, right? When you label or diagnose someone, now I know what you have. If I say you have depression, now I know what you have and how to treat it. I can look at um, treatments related to depression but it might also cause that person to view themselves differently, other people to view them differently. Let's say that two of you have the exact same score in this class. Two of you have a C. I'm gonna pick on to random, you two both have Cs in this class. But your counselor reaches out to me and says, man, he is struggling. He's got a lot going on in his life, right? Cut him, so, cut him a break. He's trying really hard. He's working really hard for that C. And your counselor reaches out to me and says, she's really gifted. She just, you know, isn't applying herself. And that's why she has a C. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to view you both very differently. I'm going to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me help you. And why aren't you rising to the occasion, right? Like, I mean, I wouldn't do that. But it could change the way that you view someone. So just know that this whole system of, like, diagnosing people and labeling people is mixed. And there are a lot of issues with it. But it is the way that we do things for now, at least. And who knows? It might change a little bit in the future. So those are all the things that I want to say kind of about setting the stage. Again, we have different models. We have those guidelines or those five Ds of abnormality. It's kind of a mixed system. We use the DSM um, in order to diagnose people. And what we'll look at from here are the different disorders. There's a lot of different categories or groups of disorders. And we'll talk about just like the major um, disorder or two in each group, starting with anxiety. And I hope I don't offend anyone with the picture. Thought it was funny, but I hope it's not offensive. Did I blow the candle out? I think I did. Did I? I'm sure I see I Sorry if it's offensive. Right? Uh, I didn't think it was. I thought it was funny. But anxiety disorders are the most common group of disorders by far. A lot of people struggle with anxiety. How many of you know someone who has an anxiety disorder or struggles with anxiety? Right? A lot of you, right? Right? You're like, I'm not going to raise my hand because I have social anxiety, right? I don't know. Like, it's a very, very common group of disorders. The most common, followed by mood. And every single one of us experiences anxiety. Anxiety is normal. It's typical. It would be abnormal if you didn't experience anxiety. 
right? That would be strange, right? Anxiety is adaptive, it's helpful. It's a feeling of fear or apprehension that is caused by something identifiable and appropriate, and it goes away with time. So let's say that you're anxious about an exam. That's normal, right? If you're anxious about the test, it drives your studying and you're nervous during the test, all of that would be normal. But let's say you took an exam three weeks ago and you're still anxious about it. Be a little less normal, right? The kind of going beyond what's identifiable and appropriate. I'll share with you that I'm always terrified the night before the first day of school. I don't sleep, like at all. Like I lay there in bed and I'm like, will the technology work? Will the lights work? Will my pants fall off? I don't know. Like the list goes on and on and on, right? Like, will I cough and not be able to stop? Like, will my water like spill all over my computer? Like I can think of a million things that could go wrong. Who's going to be in the room? How's it going to go? That's okay, right? That's normal. But at this point in week 14, 15 of the semester, if I'm still not sleeping before every night of class, I would say that I'm in the wrong profession, right? That would be abnormal. So a little bit of anxiety is fine. Anxiety disorders are when you have extreme, unrealistic, or debilitating anxiety. Your anxiety is so great that it interferes with your life, it causes you problems, or it's just not grounded in reality, right? And that's what we'll talk about a little bit. What are some of the common anxiety disorders? But know that we all have anxiety. Anxiety is normal and typical, but it can go too far. One of the more common anxiety disorders are phobias. Specific phobias, a specific intense and paralyzing fear of something that is excessive and unreasonable. Like 10% of people have phobias. I have one, right? I could tell you in a minute if you're interested. Yeah, spiders, that's mine too, right? I'm deathly afraid of spiders. Even daddy long legs, which are not dangerous at all, they're, oh, see why? They're just thinking about it. I'm like, ugh. Like, and if you have a phobia of something, like your reaction right now, right? Well, if I think about spiders too much, like my palms will sweat, right? Because they scare me. Even like I said, a daddy long legs. When we went on our honeymoon, we went on a cruise. So much fun, right? All that ice cream. Like, I did it again, right? All those years later. But uh, we went to Puerto Rico and we went on an excursion where we went to these caves and there were spiders everywhere. And I'm, I'm not talking like, like a spider, like these were like spiders, wall to wall spiders. And I literally thought I was gonna die. I spent the whole cruise, even after we had left Puerto Rico, having nightmares about them, convinced that somehow one got into my suitcase, right? My partner in the middle of the night would like pretend a spider was crawling on me. And it's so nice of her, right? Um, phobias are too easy to prey on, right? When people have them, it's, it's almost too easy. Um, but mine is spiders. A lot of people have a fear of things like spiders, heights, snakes, very, very common. There's like a lot of very common phobias because they're grounded in something that could be harmful. But a daddy long legs isn't deadly or harmful, right? That's kind of an excessive, unreasonable fear. People have phobias of cotton balls, like of random things, right? And so like the talk shows, people tend to love to dress up in like a cotton ball suit and chase them around for drama. But you can have a phobia of literally anything. Um, I have a little video that introduces them really well, so I'll play it for you. The woman in the video has a phobia of birds and feathers. Um, and when she sees a feather, you can see how her heart rate shoots through the roof just from seeing a feather. Really, really common to have that kind of a response when you have a phobia. Let me play this for you and then we can talk about it a little more. Oops heart rate just shoots through the roof, right? That's so common with phobias that when you're exposed to something that scares you like that, you have that immediate and intense, almost an overreaction, right? And if you have a phobia of something, um, it can be intense like that. Just thinking about spiders and talking about it, I checked my water before I drank it, like in case there was a spider in there somehow. Like, I mean, it's so illogical, but I had to look at it, right? Like, I'm like, no, we're good. Um, and it's just common when you have fears like that, that go beyond like a normal fear to um, have that kind of a reaction. Does anybody else have a, a phobia or know somebody who has one that wants to share? Yeah. <clears throat> Flying, like in, a, like in an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> Which is scary. <laughs> yeah. 
And that's so normal, right? A lot of phobias are rooted in like something happened to you when you were younger, it was scary, and it becomes a phobia over time, right? So do you get on an airplane where you fly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that you do get on a plane is, um, is good. A lot of people with a phobia of flying might not be willing to get on a plane if it's super severe, right? There was another hand over there, yeah? Of what? Vomit. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not uncommon either. Yeah. Right. If somebody throws up, like, well, so what? Talks about it, and then she's doing that thing. Okay. Okay. Right. By forcing yourself out, or by doing that. And that's one way that people get over phobias is they kind of you push yourself through it. It's called flooding or systematic desensitization. We'll talk about that. Um, Next week, yeah. I also have one, but I also I'm also afraid of the ocean. Like, yeah. I will not go in the ocean mm -hmm. at all. Is it like deep water, or is it the, the idea of sharks and like the animals in the ocean, or is it all of it? Or... I used to go for it. Like I love the ocean. Sure. And then one time there was like a dolphin behind me, but my sister told me it was a shark. And then I like flipped off of the like uh the wave, and I was already on top of it. But I was like, I gotta get away. Okay. And then like <laughs> yeah, and ever since then like. <laughs> my fear has just gotten bigger. Like, I'm like, there's animals. What if there's something under? Sure. You know how deep it is. Like, mm -hmm. you're going to drown. Yeah, no. We'll not go in an owl. You're like, no, thank you. Right. Yeah. And, and you know what's funny is Jaws is still the number one horror movie of all time because of the number of fears of the ocean and sharks that it inspired. In the generation before, it was Psycho, which is totally not scary at all if you've watched Psycho. But people were afraid to take showers because they would get stabbed in the shower. There's like generational fears. Chucky. It was a really common one for like years for people, clowns because of it, right? Uh, there are all these like interesting generational fears and phobias that develop from movies. Yeah. So my kind of vomit. Vomit. That's like three vomit fears, right? <laughs> yeah. Or just gross. Yeah. My dad is afraid of the ocean because of that. Sure. It's just it's so interesting to hear that. Yeah, it's really common. A lot of people have phobias of the ocean, whether that's sharks or just the deep water or what's in the ocean, the unknown. Uh, really common. And a lot of it, one big reason is not to be movies like Jaws. Movies can have a really damaging role if you watch them too young, right? And that's something that uh, we notice over and over again as psychologists. People who watch scary movies or something they didn't understand when they were little can translate into a phobia. My poor brother, my youngest brother, because I have two, right? My youngest brother, uh, terrified of like the screen mask. Because when he was little, like he's so much younger than my other brother and myself, like 15 years younger. And so we were watching Scream and he saw parts of it when he was way too young to see it. And parts of like the Halloween movies and like the Friday the 13th movie, all these movies with masks, masked evil characters, right? Which are totally not all that scary, but they're, they're scary when you're little. And so for him, he developed a fear of masks, which generalized to a fear of Halloween. My brother hates Halloween. Even now as like a 20 year old, he hates Halloween because of the masks. Like, and it still bothers him. He blames me for, cause I had like a, I always decorated for Halloween really intensely when I was younger and I had a scream mask hanging in my um, doorway. And he blames me for his fear of Halloween. I'm like, no, it's our parents made you watch scary movies too young, but maybe a little bit of both. But fears and phobias often come from early childhood stuff um, and being exposed to something when we're, we're too young. Anybody else with a phobia? I don't want to rob you of your chance to uh, share your embarrassing phobia if you wanted to. Anybody else? Like I said, mine are spiders. Yeah. I actually recently found one. I can't show the name, but it's the fear of big underwater objects. Okay. Like submarines or anchors. Interesting. I know, it's so weird. You can literally have a phobia of anything, right? Or even a phobia of fear itself. Like there's a name for every phobia, of course. Like that's interesting. I haven't heard that one, but it makes sense. Okay. Interesting. So weird. Right. People have fears of holes in the ground, right? Of cotton balls, like I said, of things in the water, of vomit, of spiders, of heights. I mean, it can literally be anything. Yeah. So some people have like a fear of bananas. Bananas, probably. I'm sure there is somebody out there, right? Those terrifying bananas. But something happened to them probably when they were younger. 
that involved a banana and it generalized into a random strange phobia. Phobias are irrational, right? To be afraid of a banana is irrational, right? But there are people who have it. And if it's your phobia, there's nothing funny about it. Like when it's somebody else's, it's hilarious. When it's yours, not so much, right? Because it's, it's something that's terrible. Yeah. No idea? Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. And some people don't know, right? And others know very clearly. For me, I remember being a preschooler and being trapped in a bathroom that had daddy long legs in it, right? And they were crawling on me. And ever since, that's why I think I hate daddy long legs so much specifically. I mean, any spider really, but daddy long legs. And so I was like four and like trapped in a bathroom in the dark and spiders crawled on me. Like, I don't know the cigar, I don't know where the teacher was, <laughs> different era, that would never happen now, right? But, uh, but I know for me, that's where it started. Sometimes people can trace it back and sometimes they can't. Did you have a... Butterflies, okay. <clears throat> Interesting, okay. Talk about reclaiming the, the fear, right? Do you know where it came from or do you? Sure. Yeah. One of them just landed on me, and I don't know what about it. Just really terrified. Huh? Like, and mm -hmm. then ever since then, I like going into one of those is my biggest fear. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of them at all either. It's interesting that you got a tattoo of it. Yeah. Anyway, like they're beautiful, but yeah, those childhood things like get stuck with you. Like a couple of you are are saying, right? Any other? Thoughts, comments, anything else? Yeah. Like, I don't fear Sure. As you should, right? They're dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You can, like I said, it could be anything, right? Again, no scary pickles, right? But like, you never know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and they love to do that on those kind of shows. Like whatever it is you're afraid of, let's expose you to it to make it dramatic. Uh, my family, or it's my partner's family, I should say, they know I have a fear of spiders. They used to put fake spiders up the lampshades, um, in my shoes, like the movie Arachnophobia. They put it in my popcorn. They put it all over the place and they'd scream. It'd scare me. Like I'd, I'd react very calmly and rationally every time. And so my mom, my mother-in-law has a fear of possession. And so I got back at her pretty well, I think, in my own personal opinion. She used to put, like I said, put spiders up everything, little plastic ones. And so after a particularly mean prank on her part, they were visiting us and staying at our house. This was like 15 years ago. And we had just watched uh, Paranormal Activity 1 back when it came out forever ago. Um, and in that movie, if you've seen it, right, Katie, the main character, just kind of stands there in the room over the bed. So I did that to my mother-in-law in the middle of the night to get back at her. It wasn't very nice of me. I was in trouble for like a week for this, but it was worth every minute of it. I stood over her bed and just stood there and waited. She didn't wake up. So I started making noises to wake her up. And when she woke up, I just stood there and stared at her. She fell out of bed and peed herself. I was like, I, <laughs> I was in a lot of trouble for that, <laughs> but it was worth it. Um, she never put spiders up anything again. So I'm going to call that a victory, even though it was probably really mean of me. <laughs> but, uh, I'll admit that. I've broken my brother's nose and I've made my mother-in-law like have an accident from scaring her so badly. I'm a good person, I swear. <laughs> May, one of them has lived in captivity as in like it's domesticated. Okay. It's lived in a house, in a cage, um, she's been tired of life. And there, right next to the crows, all these other birds will fly by all day. And the hawk comes out there, and she's like, somewhere, even if it's like far away, the birds go crazy. Like, maybe here, yeah, is so wild. Mm -hmm. They know the difference. Even though they've been, you know, in that domestic area. Interesting, yeah. And there's a lot of um, theories that fears are hardwired in us, like for animals and people, right? That that's why there are so many common fears that we're hardwired to be afraid of things like heights, spiders, snakes, and so on, because they can be very dangerous to us, right? And so um, there's a lot of common fears. This one's also really common. Um, it used to be called social phobia, but now it's called social anxiety disorder. 
A lot of people struggle with this one, right? And then this last two years, germs, contamination, getting sick has gone like through the roof, right? As far as uh, being a phobia that's very common. So, uh, and you know, some of these tend to be a little bit, like I said, generational uh, and shaped by the events that are going on around us as well. Um, let's see, I'll click on that. Progress, why isn't it moving? There we go. Other anxiety disorders that are common. Panic attacks uh, are another very common one. Uh, when I went to the hospital like two weeks ago, they thought I was having a panic attack and it made me mad because I was like, I don't have panic attacks, but it was like very, uh, my symptoms were very characteristic of it. And so they gave me like anti-anxiety medication. They were very judging me <laughs> randomly. Uh, I was like, I am not having a panic attack. Like this was like a chemical reaction. But panic attacks are very short lasting intense experiences. Anyone in here ever had a panic attack? A few of you, anyone want to describe what that was like for you? You don't have to, but any comments or anything? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's a very long minute or two, right? Yeah. Okay. You want to add to that? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you can? No. <laughs> Interesting. You know better at this point, right? And sometimes for people, um, things can be that way or they can feel unreal, almost like everything around you is like frozen or um, fuzzy, or you feel like disconnected from the world around you. There's another hand. Um, did you have a hand? Are you sure? Okay. All right. Change your mind. Okay. Yeah. 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 Super common. A lot of people who go into the emergency room for heart palpitations and those things that end up being panic attacks. Sometimes, you know, it's super difficult. But um, they can feel like you're dying. And what happens with panic attacks is the more you feel the panic stuff, the more you panic, which causes more symptoms, which causes more panic. And it goes around and around and around. And people get so wrapped up in this like panic cycle that it can be hard to turn it around and stop it. And so that's a really big. Uh, method of treatment is trying to find ways to like pull yourself down to stop that cycle from escalating. There was a, a yeah um usually when someone else is throwing out all have to like leave and sure. or shade and you know, yeah so I'm just like yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you gotta get out of there right gotta get away from whatever it is that's causing you that discomfort yeah sure she's like I freak out so bad she's in the bathroom and I was um, yeah, right. Right. If you don't like, you know, something like vomit, not to talk about it more, since there are quite a few people in here who don't like that topping, um, you know, you don't want to be anywhere near it. Right. Um, it makes it very, very difficult. Panic attacks, a little different than phobias, aren't brought on by anything specific. And that's what makes them so scary for people is they can happen randomly, right? And what happens with these is somebody can have one, we would just call that a panic attack. But if you have them recurrently, then we call it panic disorder. And what sometimes happens for people is because they've had a panic attack, they start to become afraid that they'll happen to them out in public. And so maybe they stop going out in public or they stop going to school because they had one at school or at work because they had one at work. And they can develop something called agoraphobia. So panic attacks and panic disorder often are accompanied by agoraphobia. People who don't like to leave places of, of security because they don't want to have a panic attack. They don't want to be embarrassed or out of control. Agoraphobia is a really interesting phobia in that it has a couple of different elements to it, typically related to not wanting to be embarrassed or out of control or away from a source of security. And so if somebody is having recurrent panic attacks, they can become a little bit agoraphobic and not leave their home um, because they don't want to have one out in a public place where they have no way to escape. Very, very commonly occurring um, with panic attacks. So um, this is another relatively common anxiety disorder. Again, it's a very short lasting experience, but it can wipe you out. It can feel like a very long, long time, uh, but they tend to reach a peak within a matter of like 10 minutes or so and then pass, um, even though you might be wiped out for days afterward. Another um, common anxiety disorder, OCD. Obsessive compulsive disorder. And again, all of us have elements of most of these disorders, right? Like normal to have anxiety, 
normal to be afraid of things, normal to have some like uh, ritualistic kind of behaviors. But when it starts to take up a lot of your time or interfere with your life in some way, that's when we start to think of it as a disorder. With OCD, people have disturbing thoughts, which uh, push them to perform sense senseless rituals over and over and over again. So they have what are called obsessions, involuntary thoughts that pop into your head and that drives you to perform compulsions, which are repetitive ritualistic behaviors to get rid of that anxiety. So let's say that you have obsessions around contamination and germs. That might mean that you have compulsions of like hand washing behaviors, or you don't touch certain things, or you have the hand sanitize after everything. Um, and again, those behaviors have been relatively common over the last two years, so they maybe aren't viewed in the same way. Sometimes people have obsessions about checking. I forgot to close the door. I forgot to lock my car door, right? And so they have to go back to their car repeatedly to check their car to make sure it's locked, check the coffee machine to make sure it's off, the garage door that you closed it, right? And again, some of that is normal. Every night before I go to bed, I check my front door, right? I go to my front door and I lock it. I'm just make sure it's locked before I go to sleep. Now that's normal, that's not abnormal. And it might not even be abnormal if I go back one more time. I'm like, ah, did I check it? I'm not sure, let me go check one more time. Once or twice, I'm not gonna think twice about that. But let's say that I check it several times, check it three or four times. And then on the fourth time, I have to like lock it and unlock it five times to make sure it's really locked. And then I go lay down in bed and I can't sleep because I'm not sure that I really locked it. And I'm like not sleeping because I'm so worried that I didn't actually lock the door. That's a whole nother level of severity, right? And so you see that a lot with this disorder that we all have little elements of it, but it can hit a point where it causes you a lot of time and it interferes with your life in some way. Um, and, and that happens with this disorder. I have an example of this, and I think it's a little bit on the dramatic side because it was from a, um, a television show, but it shows someone who has pretty severe um, OCD uh, around a couple of different things. And I think it's a good way of kind of seeing what this can look like. Uh, but I think you could see in that clip, right, the, the distress that he has, right? Like that he has to perform these rituals and how hard it makes his life. It doesn't always have to be that severe. I would say he has a very severe version of this, but it's really common that people with this disorder have checking behaviors or rep uh, like repetitive ritualistic behaviors that they perform uh, in order to get rid of anxiety. It's very difficult to break that cycle, right? That's one of the ways that you have to uh, tackle this is you have to break the cycle. You allow something to happen and then you don't do anything to address it. And hopefully nothing bad happens and that starts to break that conditioning cycle. This is a very, very common one. And a lot of people have some degree of it, but it doesn't get in the way of their life uh, necessarily. Only when it interferes with your life does it become uh, a disorder. A different category of disorders. These aren't common at all. These are very um, uncommon disorders, at least the second bullet or the second um, category. Psychosomatic and somatoform disorders. You know, psychosomatic, if you just look at that. Right, psycho comes from psyche, right, meaning mind. And soma means body. Right, so we're talking about like mind-body disorders for the first one. Psychosomatic disorders are disorders that involve some interaction of the mind and the body, right? That they're largely influenced or caused by stress, headaches, right? Um, tension headaches, um, migraines, ulcers, insomnia. There's a bunch of these. People can develop issues as a result of stress, which we talked about a little bit last week. Those are very, very common. What's way less common is this group. Somatoform disorders or disorders featuring somatic or body symptoms, people can develop issues without having any physical cause to it. Really, really rare, but there's a disorder called conversion disorder where people can cause themselves to go blind, lose sensation in a hand or a finger or a leg as a result of, of a trauma, typically. Now, the, the common presentation of this is you witness something so horrific that you can't handle it psychologically. So you convert it into a physical symptom and you don't even realize that you're doing it, right? It's not common at all. And the wildest part about it is you aren't doing it on purpose. You don't even realize that you're doing it. And once you do realize that you're doing it and work through it, your vision would come back. 
or that sensation loss in your hand would come back. Very rare, usually very trauma driven, uh, but these disorders involve something physically being wrong with you as a result of a psychological trauma, usually. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, right. So when you realize, so um, there was a case in the news, this is probably like 10 years at this point, but there was a soldier who accidentally shot a young boy during combat. And he started having problems with his hand, right? He was having a loss of feeling and sensation and movement in his trigger finger. It spread to his other fingers, to his hand, and then up his arm. Now, if you can imagine, if you started, you couldn't move your fingers or your hand, you would go to the doctor. You wouldn't go to a therapist, you'd go to a doctor, right? You'd be like, I'm having something neurological with my hand. They ran every test, nothing wrong with his hand, nothing wrong with his finger, no nerve damage, nothing abnormal. Eventually, they learned what had happened in combat. He went to therapy, he worked through it, sensation came back in his hand once he worked through the trauma. Uh, and so that, that tends to be the case. It's not usually quick, but it will come back once you learn that you're doing it um, and you work through whatever caused it. It's almost like your mind can't handle the trauma, so it converts it, which is where the name comes from, into a physical symptom that you can then um, tackle. So really rare. Um, this one's much more common, illness anxiety disorder, which used to be called being a hypochondriac. People who fear that every little thing um, is something severe and like deadly um, is another way that this can present. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these, but just know that the, at least the name of the category, these are disorders where something is physically wrong with you, typically because of a psychological cause rather than a physical or organic one. And the psychosomatic disorder is really common, like headaches and stomach aches and so on, as a result of dealing with stress. Yeah. So are you a Vietnam War veteran? Sure. And he told me that when he was in combat that he had witnessed his friend get blown up in battle. And yeah. And he said that, um, like, days after that would happen, he would picture it, like, every day in his head. Sure. And that his hands would start shaking. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, his arms begin to deploy because when I shook his hand, his hand was, like, sure. um, shaking and it was, like, all sweaty. And is that... That's wow. more like PTSD, oh. right? Um, which we talked about before. What would happen is, um, let's say that he witnessed his, his that happening to his friend, and he all of a sudden starts to lose his vision because of it. Like he couldn't handle what happened, and so he's having vision issues. This is this is usually really dramatic. They used to be called hysterical disorders. Um, so people lose like a sense or an ability to move something. Um, it's usually a very dramatic symptom versus what you're describing is more typical of like PTSD, right? Like having flashbacks and seeing it um, and re-experiencing that, uh, that trauma is, is a little more PTSD-like, but they can happen together as well. They can definitely occur a little bit together um, in that way, but it would be more like he loses his vision um, or his vision becomes really fuzzy without visual issues. It's more a result of the trauma. There was another, was there another hand to that question? Okay, sure. Well, okay. She, I don't really know how to explain it, but like all of a sudden she'll be like really sick. Okay. And like she's like, it's a stomach problem. I have a stomach problem, right? And then I went in there, but they don't see any. But like it's, it keeps happening. Sure. So I was wondering if that could be like something like that. Or it could be. Um, there's a, it's not on here because it's uh, beyond what we need to know for here. But there's a disorder called somatization disorder where you take your stress and you manifest it as physical symptoms that aren't dramatic. So maybe stomach aches or like a headache or like a sexual or gastro, um, like GI symptom. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so look up, um, you could look up if, you, if you're interested, it's called somatization disorder. Um, and oftentimes what that is, is people having a lot of smaller issues, physical issues, as a result of anxiety or stress or maybe even trauma. Mm -hmm. Somatization disorder. Yeah. <clears throat> In a way, right, like with the placebo effect, you create something because of your expectation. Here you're creating something because you couldn't handle what happened. So there, there's a commonality. It's that crazy unconscious power of your mind. To think that you could cause yourself to go blind unintentionally is wild. And that, that that would go away when you realize it, right? Our minds are very, very powerful. If you've ever had someone around you have a cold, 
right? You start to feel sick, right? Like my daughter was coughing yesterday and all of a sudden I was like, <laughs> like, uh oh, I'm getting sick. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not sick. You just got off antibiotics. You're fine. She's sick, right? But if somebody near you is sniffling, you might all of a sudden start to feel sick because your mind is worried about it. And maybe it is that you got sick, right? That can happen. But our mind can manifest a lot of issues for us uh, without even meaning to, which is just wild to think. Do you think that's um, a determined like, like, I mean, it depends, right? That could just be that someone around you is using a substance and, and so you're uh, inhaling it rather than using it. Um, but there are a lot of things like this. Um, not quite that, but uh, sometimes when people have a partner who's pregnant, they can experience the symptoms of pregnancy as like a sympathetic reaction. Um, it's really uh, wild. So it's if men, women, other anyone, like the partner of someone who's pregnant can sometimes experience um, like morning sickness and cramps and moodiness and cravings, the things that like their pregnant partner is experiencing um, as like a sympathetic reaction. We, we tend to be very much that way as people. Uh, so that it could be that, but usually with like a second hand high or something like that's because you're um, inhaling or being exposed to whatever someone else is using. But um, the idea behind that is kind of is kind of sound. So again, these aren't very common, but they do definitely happen. Uh, these ones are also not very common, but incredibly interesting. The dissociative disorders are disorders in which some part of your personality becomes separated from the rest. Maybe you have memory related issues, or it could be that you have more than one personality present in an individual, right? And this happens. Again, they're not very common, but they do definitely happen, usually involving memory loss, changes of identity, multiple identities. This by far is the most wild of all of them, the one that most people have heard of, dissociative identity disorder. Anyone know what it used to be called or commonly called? Multiple personality disorder or split personality disorder. Um, the technical name is dissociative identity disorder, that people have dissociated identities within one individual. And I have to tell you that I saw this once in my life. I've seen this once and once only, um, but it was like absolutely fascinating. And like, maybe you just absolutely love psychology even more. Right? When I was training to become a therapist, uh, in the first couple of semesters, you perform therapy and you're supervised, you're videotaped. Um, and as I was training, one of my very first clients had dissociative identity disorder and didn't know it. And neither did I. It was really wild and I'll never forget it. Uh, so I had this client who was a college student, young, like in her uh, maybe like early 20s, late teens. And she had gone off to school and was experiencing a lot of anxiety and depression. She missed her family and was struggling socially. So I saw this, um, this young girl, like I saw her uh, maybe for six weeks, six sessions. And every time she came in, she was quiet, like kind of mousy, mousy, quiet, timid, depressed, struggling, right? I diagnosed her with depression. Um, and my supervisor, who's like a monitor and we discuss our cases, it had agreed. And then one week she came in, it was like the seventh or eighth week, sixth, seventh, eighth week, somewhere in there. She came in and she was through the roof activity, like, like really, really up, agitated, talking a million miles a minute about people she had never mentioned before, just completely up, almost like she had taken like, had like six cups of coffee before she walked through the door, right? And in my mind, I was like, okay, she has bipolar disorder, which we'll talk about next class. And I'm just now seeing the manic side. I've seen the depressed side, now I'm seeing the mania. And so I talked to my supervisor about it. I'm like, I think she had a manic episode, changed her diagnosis to bipolar disorder, and didn't think a whole lot of it. I was like, okay, so just to change it. Sometimes people's disorders change, right? As you find out more information. But here's where it got interesting. The next session after that, she came in and the first thing she says to me is I want to apologize for missing our session next week. She's like, I don't remember where I was. I'm not sure what happened. It's not like me, but I'm really sorry that I wasn't here. And she's back to quiet, and depressed and kind of mousy. I'm like, okay, she's cycled back to depression. But she had no memory of coming in. And I was like, no, you were here, but I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to talk to you about it. I pull out my notes and I'm like, you were talking about these people. You were really like agitated and up last week. Uh, you know, how are all those things going? I'm just checking in with her. And she, in like the kindest way possible, 
was like, I'm pretty sure you have me confused with somebody else. Like I didn't come last week and I don't know those people. And I, I don't think that's me. Like, I'm really sorry. Like she was so nice about it. She's like, I'm really sorry, but I don't think, I think you're m- mixed up. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like I, this, this is like, I have my notes I'm, in my mind. I'm like, no, no, I'm right. I know I'm right. Like it's maybe second guess for a moment though. It was so bizarre. And we couldn't move past it. Like she was like, I wasn't here. I wasn't here. I'm like, yes, you were. Like it was was almost getting to that point of like, yes, no, yes, no. Like we couldn't move beyond it. And in my head, I'm going like, I'm not the one in therapy here. Like I know you were here, right? Like in my head, in my head, I would never say that, right? Um, I wasn't a bad therapist. It just wasn't, it was heavy. And And so we couldn't, like I said, we couldn't move beyond it. So every session when you're a trainee is videotaped. So we went, I was like, with your permission, would you mind if I went and got the video? Okay, because it was, it was, it was important, right? I knew it was important that we figured this out. And I went and got the video and we watched it together and we brought my supervisor in because this was really atypical. I mean, no memory of the session is not normal. And my client just starts crying. She's like, that's me, but what am I wearing? What am I talking about? Like, I have no memory of that. And I'm just sitting there going like, what is happening right now? Just so intellectually like peaked by this, right? Like what's happening? And it turned out that my client had been having these lapses of memory. All of these times she didn't remember things that were happening. She would have blackouts of periods of time. It turned out and like I had to, sadly I had to refer her out because I didn't have the expertise to help her. And so I had to refer her to someone with more experience but it turned out she had developed an alternate personality as a way of coping with the stress and anxiety of going off to college. It was that anxiety inducing for her that she created a personality that was extroverted and outgoing and really like uh, sociable and was completely different than her normal personality. And she had memory loss when she switched to this other individual that was within her. Crazy. I've never seen that again in my life. And it was very memorable. Uh, But this doesn't tend to be common. It can be very subtle or it can be wildly different. And sometimes people have two, three, five different personalities present within one individual, right? Uh, The record number was 128, I want to say, but it's usually more like three, four, five, and they typically serve a function, right? If somebody has a really hard time with one thing, they might develop a personality or an identity that compensates for that in some way. Really badly misrepresented in the media oftentimes, uh, but this is something that, that can happen almost usually, almost always it's rooted in trauma. Something traumatic happens, so they create another identity to handle it because they can't handle it themselves. Yeah. So this is a subconscious kind of thing where <clears throat> like the person will um, think being happy or okay with something else and kind of just... So it's beyond faking, right? Like it's beyond like sometimes, right? When we're upset or depressed or we're struggling, we might overcompensate and act opposite, right? Uh, it's beyond that. This is actually a completely separate fragment of a personality. So they might have a different name, different memories, different mannerisms, a different age, different gender. Like, I mean, their preferences can be all over the board. And what dictates how difficult this is, is how much memory loss they have. Sometimes people are aware of the other personalities. That one's way easier to work with. If personality A is aware of B and C and D and so on, they can actually switch on command. You could be like, I'd like to speak to personality B and B could come forward. But what's much more common is oftentimes people don't have any awareness of their other identities. And so there's memory loss. They only remember what happens when they're in personality B. And so personality B has no awareness of A and A has no awareness of F and you know they they share no memory. That's really difficult to work. So it's a little bit beyond. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've seen a couple of um his things. I haven't seen the one related to this, so I'll have to look that up. That'll be interesting. But yeah, it, uh, it's a real thing. It's very controversial. People tend to think it's fate, but it, it usually is something that's really legitimately present. And um, they've done studies on like brainwave patterns of the different identities, and they'll be different. They'll have different body rhythms and patterns and temperatures. Like it's, it's wild. This can be very dramatic or it can be super, super subtle. Yeah. Yeah. 
there are, they're difficult, but um, how does it, Yeah, a lot of it, um, the biggest thing that you have to do is something called fusion, which you don't, you don't need to know for this class, but oftentimes it's looking at the purpose of each identity and then eliminating them by not making them needing, needed anymore. So let's say like with my client, you have a, her identity was someone who was very outgoing and extroverted and um, had no reservations about things. So how can we find a way to build some of those skills into your core personality so that that identity isn't needed anymore? Or how can we work through the trauma that developed this personality in the first place? Um, and it takes a long time. And if there's memory loss, you have to do journaling so that you can try and remember the things that happen as a different identity. And sometimes the, the journaling, different handwriting styles and writing styles, it's wild because the different personalities write differently. Or they might be different ages with different like language ability. Wild, yeah. So when getting treated, between the core personality and secondary personality, would, would they ever try to get rid of the core personality when the secondary was better for them? Usually not. Um, it would be finding ways to incorporate them, like fuse them together. Um, but sometimes you might be dealing with what you think is the, the primary personality and it's not. So it can take a long time. If they aren't aware of each other, you kind of have to wait for them to emerge. And that can take a long time. To happen and then you have to re-educate each personality on what's happening um, and so if they have several it can make it a little challenging so much work it could be right so um we'll talk we could talk a little bit more about it next time but we're um, out of time for today so we'll we'll stop here and then when i see you on wednesday we'll keep going with the disorders if you have any other questions we can talk a little more here but um have a good rest of the day and i'll